Greetings students, welcome to this recording on the basics of conducting a journal critique for a case control study. The t During the course of this presentation, I will be making reference to this folder on your Blackboard module. And the study I will be referencing is a case control study here to periodically show examples of areas to critique as per the guidance document. At this moment, you can pause the recording and pull up this document uh, so that we can go step by step. The first point to consider here is target population and representativeness. The case and control population have to be representative of the target population the case control study hopes to apply its findings to. And so you should examine the recruitment procedures to see where do they recruit their cases and controls to see that they are representative of the population from which they are drawn. And this is really somewhat of an external validity assessment. Where was this population drawn from and who would be the target population? And once you identify who the target population is, you see how representative this is of the general population. So let's take a look at the study. The study title is Dominant Modifiable Risk Factors for Stroke in Ghana and Nigeria. And this is a SIREN study that was part of the H3 Africa Consortium study. If we look at the recruitment procedures for the study, we will see, we'll just give this a moment to load. We will see that the participants were recruited from different clinics in Ghana and different clinics in Nigeria, specifically 15 sites. So the Stroke Investigative Research and Educational um, Network, SIREN study, is a multi-center case control study. So who would the cases and controls be representative of? They would be representative of participants from Nigeria and Ghana. So the extent of the external validity and representative of the study would be representative of um, um, persons living in those countries. So we can even take a deeper look here. Let me just maximize the screen here. Okay. And in examining here, we see that they were done, and the study was done in 15 sites. And this is also another point I wanted to bring up. For large studies, sometimes the study protocol may be published elsewhere. And so sometimes you may need to pull up this journal article to see additional things related to the study design. And so I would encourage you to do so if that happens to be the case with your particular study. The next point, groups recruited from the same population. You always want to make sure that cases and controls are recruited from the same population. In other words, when you're looking at case control studies, your control population has to be a group who would have or be exposed to um, or who would have the potential to be a case. So they really should be in the same population. So you can't get a case population recruited from the hospital and then you get a control population living in the community. So in that case, the case and control population would be misaligned because the cases are more severe, um, are persons who are severely ill and the controls are people living in the community. If you're conducting a case control study in a hospital setting, then you'd find cases who are um, who have your outcome of interest and controls who are admitted at the same time in the hospital but who don't have your disease of interest. That's a better control population to compare to because then they're arising from the same population or individuals who are sick at the time. They just didn't happen to have um, the, your, your particular case disease. So let's see whether this was the case in the study that we have. Looking down at the method section, okay, let's look at the further description of the study design and how they recruited cases. Briefly, stroke cases were consecutively consenting in unconscious or aphiastic patients consent was obtained from the next of kin with the first clinical stroke within eight days of current symptom or onset or last deficit. So these were the case criteria. Okay. And they've also listed exclusion criteria in the appendix. So if we turn to the appendix, uh, let's see if we turn to the appendix section. Hold on just a second. <laughs> 
So I went online as you would have to if you had an article that provided additional information online to go and pull up the supplementary information and the appendix for this particular study. And in the appendix section, they listed the names of the participating centers, the 15 sites, as well as the exclusion criteria that they mentioned was listed in the appendix. And we will need these exclusion criteria. So you see patients unable to communicate, extra axial hemorrhage, tumor or brain abscess, uh, individuals who are currently hospitalized for coronary disease, people who had subarachnoid hemorrhage, people who were unable to provide consent and there was no surrogate available to provide consent. Again, this is for ethical reason, a known previous history of stroke, age under 18 years. So um, we can see who was um, excluded from the study and we'll keep this open as well. And then let's look at the control population. Where were the control population recruited from? So again, we turn to the method section <clears throat> and we see controls were consenting stroke-free adults mostly from communities in the catchment areas of the Siren study hospitals where cases were recruited while some were recruited from the study hospitals. So here one can make an argument that they had a mixed batch of, of controls. Some are from the hospital, some are from the community and the two are very different populations and that's something that you could critique because the idea is that the control population should arise from the same population as the case population. The case population individuals who are hospitalized or are seeking care already. Whereas if you find control individuals in the community, the control individuals in the community are ambul they're ambulating and they're, they're relatively uh, not in the same situation as those who are hospitalized. Whereas the, the controls recruited from the study hospitals may be more uh, applicable in this case. So that's something you could critique as a potential weakness in the study. The third point, the third point was a sample size calculation done. If a sample size calculation is done at all times, this is a study strength because it means that you've recruited enough people to be able to find a difference if a difference really exists. Uh, I'll repeat the needle in a haystack example. If you're looking for a needle in a haystack, the needle may be there, but you may not be able to see it with your naked eye. Right. So the needle here being the statistical difference. But if you get a magnifying glass, magnifying glass to look at the haystack, you then are able to find the difference because you have this instrument and vehicle to allow you to see the difference. So a sample size calculation allows you to detect how many people exactly do you need to include in the study for you to be able to see a statistical difference. If you don't accrue enough of a sample to be able to see the difference, you will never see the difference statistically, even though the difference in reality exists. And so let's turn to our paper to see whether the statistical a sample size calculation was done. If we turn to page five, we will see this statement here. And as I said in previous recordings, the sample size calculations are usually found under the statistical analysis section. A sample size of 2000 cases and 2000 controls will be sufficient to give an 80% power to detect an effect size of odds ratio at least 1.4. All you need to know is that the sample size power is over is at least 80% and that it was done. Because it was done, that um, is a stronger study design and you can report that as a strength in the study. Inclusion and exclusion criteria pre-specified and applied uniformly. Were the inclusion and exclusion criteria developed prior to recruitment and were the same criteria used? So we look at the case and control population recruitment. We also looked at the exclusion criteria online here and we can see there was nothing in the methods section that pointed to the fact that um, the recruitment criteria were changed over time um, from what they initially decided to do. And so again, we can say that this is a strength in the study in that the exclusion criteria and inclusion criteria were applied consistently. Were outcome measures uh, and just to go back to that point, if it were not the case, then you would address the issue of bias due to confounding potentially, um, because then you're recruiting individuals who um, do not meet your in, your exter your um, inclusion criteria, and then they may include individuals who have potentially extraneous factors that may affect your study outcome. So, for example, they decided to exclude individuals who um, um, had a known previous history of stroke. 
So if they include individuals who had prior history of stroke, that may have muddied up their results and ultimately the odds ratios they would have gotten would have been inaccurate. And so at this point, um, we are we are um, we are we are reducing bias due to confounding in this case. The next point were outcome measures and exposure measures, and and I would also add here and covariate. methodologically sound. So all the covariates, all the uh, the outcome measures and the exposure measures, were they measured in a way that is methodologically sound? So let's go back to the paper again. In going through the paper um, and in reading the title, we can see that the outcome was stroke and they were looking for different modifiable risk factors. So and they collected several covariates. So let's see how those things were measured. Okay. So let's go to the method section because that's where this information is likely to happen. So stroke phenotyping is how they described stroke. Stroke phenotyping was based on clinical assessment and brain neuroimaging, ECG, transthoracic um, echocardiography, and carotid Doppler ultrasound done in accordance with standard operating procedures. Ischemic stroke was typically clinically was typed clinically with Oxford community uh, with the Oxford Community Stroke Project criteria. So this gives us encouragement that <clears throat> their definition of stroke was based on standardized criteria, and that it was not a loose definition in 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 ways that we could potentially have classified individuals as cases who did not have stroke. Um, when they actually had some other illness. And in doing so, we are ensuring that there's no misclassification bias, specifically as it relates to the outcome, to make sure that individuals who are actually defined as cases were truly cases. Let's turn to the covariates that were collected in the study. So under data collection, we find information related to that. We collected basic demographic and lifestyle data, including ethnic origin of the participants and their parents, socioeconomic status, cardiovascular risk profile, and dietary patterns. We used validated instruments to assess these variables here. Okay, And this information is also found in the appendix. Here we can see in the list of variables collected exactly how this information was collected. Neurological assessment was done using this scale. We can see that physical assessment was done using um, um, standard operating procedures across all sites. And so we are confident that for these specific variables that they were collected well and that there was reduction of misclassification bias. And again, I'm only looking at some of these things, but if you were to take a look at the article deeper, you may be able to mention more issues. The whole point of this guidance discussion is to point you in the right direction. So I may not cover everything and all things possibly as it relates to methodological um, strengths in terms of classifying the covariates well. But if it was your paper, my expectation is that you would go a step further and look deeply at all the other covariates. Okay. Was there bias due to unadjusted confounding? Looking at unadjusted confounding is looked at in two aspects. One, did they use some type of a regression technique, specifically a multiple regression technique to ensure that the confounders were adjusted for? Secondly, did they, of the covariates they collected, were there any variables that they should have collected that they didn't collect that could potentially have influenced the outcome? And in so doing, uh, make them in, put them in a position where they are unable to control for those particular confounding factors. So let's take a look at the the, the paper to see uh, how we. So in looking at our documentation here, we see that they did use a conditional logistic regression model with adjustment for potential confounders. And so this makes us uh, confident that there was adjustment of covariates in the study and therefore reducing the potential of bias due to confounding. We can also look at the study covariates that were collected and ask ourselves, were there any other variables that should have been collected that were not? And let me move to the tables here. <clears throat> 
So table one, I had to rotate the diagram a little bit so you could see it better. It gives us information on the comparison of um, participants based on the case and control status at baseline. We can see that the gender, age, rural urban status, monthly income, education level, hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, cardiac disease, HDL, LDL, total cholesterol, triglycerides, waist hip ratios, BMI, physical activity, tobacco use, alcohol use, stress, cancer, depression, dietary intake in the form of salt intake. They also looked at consumption of various uh, proteins, legumes, and whole grain, um, whole grains and green leafy vegetables. So they really try to adjust for most of the risk factors that are related to cardiovascular disease. And so um, based on this comprehensive list of covariates they collected, we can, um, we can be confident that there was um, very little uh, sources of confounding that was unadjusted for. Blinded exposure assessment. In some instances, case control studies will identify exposures also in a blinded fashion. In this case, it does not apply to our study because our exposures of interests um, were not done in a blinded exposure assessment, but they were data, data. This is data that was gathered objectively from the participants and recorded as such. Um, but in some instances, let's say you wanted to truly make sure that someone was exposed to a particular risk factor and the risk factor in question was a disease, you could also do blinded exposure assessment where you have a blinded group of individuals who look at the individuals who have been classified as exposed and look at the circumstances of exposure and truly determine whether they were exposed to the risk factor or not in past history. And that wasn't the case here. And so we um, this is not applicable to us. If it is done, it's in, done in an effort to reduce misclassification bias. Next, the timing of the exposure measurements. If hospital records were used, the investigators verify the, that the date the patient was exposed to was prior to being a case. Um, that was done in this particular study because individuals were identified as cases and controls, and then they looked back at historical information that was provided to them. Random selection of study participants. In some instances, in some studies, they would um, select cases and then randomly select controls. So let's see if this was done in this study. And in this case, we can just do a keyword search of random, so I don't disrupt the orientation of this table. And looking at the word random, we don't see it there. And so um, there was no random selection of participants. If it is done, it is a good thing because it, it tries to ensure that of the pool of eligible controls that there is no selection bias in terms of who is selected as a control. And so the potential for bias is minimized in that respect. The reason why this isn't done is usually people want to use 100% of all cases and controls available. And sometimes you don't have the luxury of randomly selecting controls for the cases you have selected. So it's usually just a limitation, right? If you end up having, um, if you have 200 cases and you identify 200 controls, why would you then want to randomly select of the 200? It would include all of them. So it's pointless. Or sometimes if you have, you five, you've identified 100 cases and you have um, 200 eligible controls and you want to randomly select 100, sometimes it is, it is much more methodologically appropriate to include all the controls available rather than trying to randomly select. But in situations where you have the luxury of having a lot of sample to pick from, specifically if you're doing a case control study using records where you have millions and millions of records, then you can randomly select controls for cases which you've identified and in that case, you can uh, increase the um, uh, sort of reduce bias in selection of controls by randomly selecting them rather than assigning them. Lastly is the global question. Is there anything else done in the study design, selection of participants, the care setting, uh, care setting selected, observation times, 
data collection methods that either improved or minimized the study's ability to accurately estimate the effect of the exposure on the outcome. The goal of this study is to, of every study, I should say, is to identify the relationship between the exposure, exposures, and the outcome. And so it is important for us to be able to look through anything else besides what we have looked at from number one to number nine that could have influenced in a good way the accuracy of the estimate of the effect of the exposure on the outcome or reduced the accuracy of the estimate obtained on the effect of the exposure on the outcome or exposures on the outcome. So let's take a look at some of the procedures that were done. Among the first that came to mind, and let me turn back to the beginning of the paper. Okay. So it'd be uh, oriented appropriately. You, if you saw in the uh, case definition, they were using surrogates to be able to identify information if a case was not able to participate. Right. So briefly, stroke cases with con consecutive consenting in unconscious or phasic patient consent was obtained from the next of kin. And also from the supplementary information that I was able to pull up online, they actually were very explicit in stating how they reduce potential sources of bias. Now, this is not common with all types of studies, so don't get overexcited. This is just one of the studies where they actually in had additional supplementary information. So they use surrogate respondents for patients unable to communicate because of severe stroke of aphasia. This can be seen as a positive thing, but it can also be viewed as a negative thing. If you want to argue this is a negative thing, you would say there's bias due to having surrogate interviews, which we talked about in class, where people may tend to over-report or under-report certain symptoms because they're family. Um, the other advantage is you can help uh, gain additional information from individuals who you would have you would have had to missing information on right so you could argue it both ways also um, in the supplementary information they talked about um, um, they talked about training activities so they developed a diagnostic algorithm and conducted training workshops for the study uh, staff this is a positive thing and um, I'll upload the supplementary information for you as well on the folder. But again, what I'm saying is, if you have a study that has a reference to supplementary information, I urge you to look for that information because it may help you answer certain questions. So this information on training was not in the main paper, but in the um, supplementary information. So this is a positive thing because it means that everybody was trained consistently on how to access and provide patient information. And so this is adds to the strength of the study design. The other potential source of bias is recall bias, which is always prone, um, which is always an issue to look at and um, in case control studies, because you're looking for information about exposure in the past, which may not be recalled uh, equally by cases and controls, and in so doing may introduce bias. So you might, um, particularly for this study, you have individuals who you know, have had strokes, and so their memory is already compromised to, cer to a certain extent, and so you're asking them for information about past history of exposure, which may or may not be as accurate. Also, given that the information was collected from self-report in certain cases, we cannot underestimate the potential for uh, uh, reporting bias, particularly in collecting information about smoking, information about diet, as we saw, right? Depending upon how the information was collected, people may or may not be willing to divulge um, the information about their, their intake of carbohydrates. So that could also be a potential uh, issue that you could raise. And um, just to support our, our assessment of the study, um, I also want to go through a little bit of, of the results. That's not part of the critique. I just want us to practice now that we have an article in front of us. So let's go to the table that provided the results. And I want you to practice how to interpret. So again, as I said, this is not part of the critique. 
right? Not part of the critique section. You're not critiquing. I'm just showing you how to uh, interpret the results, which is useful for the summary section of your assignment. So I just want us to practice. So this is showing adjusted odds ratios uh, for stroke. And they also provided population attributable risk. Um, we're not going to go through this part, but we're going to focus more on this part. But you can make reference to what we learned in class about population attributable risk. And they just determined this as a percentage. So focusing on this column, we can see which factors here were, um, were related to stroke, right? Because the whole purpose of the study was to see what were the risk factors that were associated with stroke. Remember, this is a case control study. We can only show associations. Um, being over the age of 50, based upon this, this increased your, um, your likelihood of having a stroke because you can see that you have greater odds of having a stroke if you were over 50, right? Education had no effect because it was not statistically significant. Monthly income did have an effect. If you made more money, you had higher risk of stroke. So the so-called, if you have more money, more problems. So more money means perhaps that you're eating a heavier diet, particularly in African countries, and this may increase your risk of stroke because you're heavier in weight, um, because that is also a sign of wealth, and this is reflective in the results. This is statistically significant as well. And remember, these are adjusted odds ratios, so they're being adjusted for other factors. Having high lipids, uh, or just dyslipidemia, if your lipids are off, yes, higher likelihood of having a stroke. If you have diabetes, not surprising. If you have cardiac disease, not surprising. Um, physical inactivity, not surprising, higher, higher odds, not high risk, higher odds, because this is an odds ratio. Um, again, higher waist to hip ratio, you have elevated odds or higher likelihood of developing a stroke. Stress, family history of CVD, just on the border of not statistically significant because there's inclusion of one here. Salt intake. Um, not consuming low uh, green leafy vegetables. If you if you consume if you consume less of this, you have greater risk. Um, so this, these results are not surprising based on what we know are risk factors for stroke. But the the purpose of the study was to identify what risk factors were more important in this patient population. And looking at this, what would you say was the most important risk factor? Just looking at the size of the odds ratios, hypertension was the biggest. And this is not surprising. If you had hypertension, you had close to 20 times the odds of developing a stroke. This is not uncommon in African countries. Uh, hypertension, if uncontrolled, is usually what leads to strokes most of the time. So I just wanted to quickly review the results with you now that we were looking at a paper so that you would continue to practice your skill set in interpreting results, which you will need to do so for your own paper. So moving on to the critique, let's go back. We've looked at several issues. Uh, from points 1 to 10. Now, lastly, let's look at examining uh, what is the internal and external validity, and I think we have some idea. The external validity is limited because this study was done in Ghana and Nigeria, so we are limited to this patient population. So where we see risk factors such as hypertension uh, being critical uh, in this population, you know, stress may be more critical in, in, in other areas. So the results are primarily applicable to Nigeria and Ghana. Internal validity, I think this was a well-conducted case control study, to be quite frank. They did, they went over and above what is usually done in case control studies. They did a sample size calculation, which is usually not done. Right? They're not expected to do it, they did it. They had standardized criteria for measuring all their study variables. They trained a large number of their staff to ensure that they um, collected accurate information. And so we can point to all these things as um, strengths in the study. And so uh, my assessment would that be this is a good study. So that ends our brief 